me, Brandon Steckler again, tech editor of Motor Age Magazine. And I want to thank you for joining me for today's video, uh, part two in the series of Mastering Diagnostics with yours truly. I'm following up with the last video's theme of capturing data correctly. Again, it's one thing to have the correct data, but it's another thing to capture that data at the appropriate time. So there's a couple of different things you can do to help yourself gather the data appropriately so you can analyze it and make a proper and accurate as well as efficient diagnosis. Today's theme of the video is going to be talking about trigger criteria. Now what a trigger is, is a command to your lab scope on when to capture data and where to draw the data, the captured data, on the scope screen to favor more of the right side of the screen or more of the left side of the screen. Doing so in that fashion allows you to strategize on whether or not you're going to see more data captured after the fault occurs or more data captured leading up to the fault. So using that strategy can really help you flush some faults to the service. And this is particularly handy, especially when dealing with intermittent drivability faults, like an intermittent stall. Or, or a hiccup, if you will, a drivability symptom being exhibited for a very brief moment in time. So we are going to be using my personal vehicle again, a 2007 Honda Civic. And before we get started, of course, we are going to have to do some research. So we're going to be referencing our service information to do just that. So even before we approach service information, we have to put some thought and logic into this diagnostic approach and having an understanding of how things work is what it's going to take to do that. So for instance, I definitely want to interrogate my customer on what it is that's occurring, the symptoms they are experiencing, what is bringing them to me for the analysis. And what we are trying to simulate here is an intermittent stall or sometimes the vehicle does not stall and, and turn off all the way, it hiccups uh, almost comes to a stall and comes right back to life again. Now the problem is the customer states this doesn't happen all the time and after asking a few questions I have determined that it occurs more so on on bumpy or rough roads. So keeping that in mind um, I think about a scenario that would cause the car to stall during rough or bumpy conditions and in my mind I'm picturing uh, an improper connection, a loose connection, perhaps a broken wire within a harness. So I'm going to first and foremost keep my eyes open for anything suspicious like an improperly secured harness or maybe one that appears to have uh, an area that's been rubbed through. Another question that comes to mind is before this symptom occurred or leading up to this symptom being exhibited, were there any recent repairs performed? Having an idea of where a previous technician was at under the hood of the vehicle or, or under the vehicle uh, could potentially lead me to that fault or the cause of that fault even before I begin testing. We call that a preliminary analysis or pre, uh, preliminary inspection. So I'll give you, I'll give you the, some background information. Excuse me. After looking under the hood for anything suspicious, I really don't see anything. I road tested the vehicle and I could reproduce the fault again over rough running roads. So what I'm going to do is begin to capture data with my Fortrace lab scope um, that might indicate to me when a fault occurs or, or the cause of that fault. And uh, in my mind, there are two things that could cause an intermittent stall or hiccup, a loss of spark or a loss of injector pulse. And this stall would mean it would have to happen on all four cylinders for the stall to occur. Could I be wrong? Possibly, but, but using some logic, that is where I'm going to begin my testing. Um, a roll of the dice will let me choose either between monitoring for a loss of spark or monitoring for a loss of injector pulse. And uh, that all depends on the equipment you have. Are we, do we have one trace lab scope that we're using or perhaps two traces where we can monitor two pieces of information at once? Perhaps we are using a four trace lab scope or even an eight trace lab scope. How much how much available data you can view at the same time determines what test or, or where you're going to be uh, performing your tests on which circuits. So we're going to be using a four trace lab scope and I'm going to begin my testing 
on the ignition system. So as you can see, I've opened up all data as a service repair information source. And I'm not choosing all data over any other information source I have available to me. It's just one I happen to stumble upon first. Um, all information sources have their ups, and all of them have their downs. And all data is no exception to that. Nonetheless, that's what we're using. So I'm going to diagrams for my 2007 Honda Civic. And I'm going to scroll down to ignition system so I can see how it's configured. This is going to allow me to build a game plan on how to approach this vehicle. So for demonstration, I've taken the screenshot and uploaded it to paint so I can draw and show you how I view this. I use a color coding technique that I learned from George Menchu of AES Wave, and it's been tremendously beneficial in uh, my success. So colors represent the circuit and, and the status of that circuit during any particular time. So I'm using the color red to indicate when battery voltage is present. And according to this diagram, it's hot at all times, which means battery voltage is present everywhere you see red. At the bottom of the diagram, we're using the color green to represent ground. And we can see all four ignition coils are connected directly to ground at all times. The control side of the relay is connected to the ECM on the ground side. So when the ECM provides a ground path, this ignition coil relay becomes energized, forms a magnet, and causes these contacts to close. I'll be using the color orange to indicate switched voltage, so when the relay contacts close, what you see in red will provide an orange voltage supply to all four ignition coils commonly. And last but not least, the third wire, one, two, and three, the third wire at the ignition coil is the command from the PCM to turn on each coil individually and then turn them off to induce the spark. So knowing this, this is how we are going to approach the vehicle and interface to the vehicle with our lab scope. So right now I'm going to describe my scope channels, what they are referencing, because I want my data to tell the whole story. So here on channel A in blue, I am looking at the crankshaft position sensor signal wire. This is the input to the PCM to make the decision to fire the ignition coils. On channel B, which is red, um, is going to be voltage supply to the ignition coil. Now this supply, according to the wiring diagram, is common to all four ignition coils. So I'm just going to be monitoring one. On channel C, over here, we are looking at an amp probe signature coming from the common fuse point. What the amperage waveform is going to show us is the work being done in the ignition system, and it's going to be indicative of when the stall occurs. We're going to be able to see the dropout in that signal. And on channel D, in yellow, I am monitoring the command from the PCM to turn ignition coil 1 on and off. Yes, a stall was going to involve more than one ignition coil, but I figure if the stall was occurring, whatever happens on ignition coil 1, 2, 3, and 4 is going to be visible from at least one of them. So that's my mindset. That's where I'm going to start. So as you've seen from the live movie, uh, I was able to wiggle the harness and induce the symptom. Um, in fact, I was not able to get the vehicle to stall. However, I was able to get it to hiccup. And the point is, it happened for a very brief amount of time. Um, if we implement our cursors, we can see that that dropout only lasted... for approximately 172 milliseconds, less than two-tenths of a second. 
So our reaction time to capture this data, especially if we were driving the vehicle, um, would, would be very slow compared to the speed of the fault. And as a result, the data may have been missed, depending on how we had our lab scope set up. So the fact that we triggered it served as a virtual pause on the screen, as you can see here. And now I'm simply going to zoom into my capture to analyze it. We've got four pieces of data on the screen, and the point is the four pieces of data tell the story. So to make analysis a little bit easier, I'm going to be shoving the data closer together, and we'll analyze it. Now red is voltage supply to the coil. Yellow is the command from the PCM to turn the coil on and to turn the coil off. And green is the input that the PCM needs to see to make the decision to turn the coil on and off. And green, being current flow, represents the work being done. In other words, this is the command for the coil to turn on and off. I'm sorry, this is. And this is the actual coil turning on and off. So let's zoom in for a tighter view. Now, I have insufficient sample rate on my screen here at only 400 kilosamples per second, which is, which is very low, uh, but we can still make a diagnostic decision here. So as we can see, according to our green channel, coils were turning on and off in turn and then for a moment the coils stopped functioning the car felt like it was going to stall that was the hiccup we felt and then coil activity returned so this is the work not being performed this is what we felt and now we have to ask why so why did we get the command for the coils to turn on and off? We sure did. Here's a command for coil number one. Here's the next command for coil number one. One full engine cycle later, and as a result, we can see no current flow activity was occurring. So the PCM definitely gave the command to fire the coil. However, it didn't happen. And we have to ask why. If we were missing the yellow command, I would then have to reference the crankshaft position sensor. Would there be a reason why the PCM chose not to deploy the command? However, we don't have to do that because we have the command. And it's obvious that we have the crankshaft position sensor signal input. So referencing what else we have left on the screen is voltage supply to the coil. And as you could see, Voltage supply went from approximately 14 volts, oops, down to approximately 0 volts. Matter of fact, that's a bit better off. 281 millivolts. So like anything else, if we don't have adequate voltage supply or ground supply, we can't expect that device to function. Now, of course, I only have four channels on the scope screen. And because the current flow told me my ignition coil uh, activity dropped off, I know I'm definitely in the right spot. However, we don't see a problem here. We don't see a problem here. Of course, we do see a problem here on the red trace, meaning voltage supply, but if we didn't, we would then have to move this trace to the ground side and then repeat this test. Now, if I had more traces available, like an 8-trace lab scope, I could do all of that at once. As a matter of fact, I can also analyze the injector waveforms as well. But again, we are limited to a four trace lab scope. We got lucky on this one that our dropout did occur in one of the three channels displayed when we lost our current flow. So as you can see, having a game plan in place and using the lab scope the appropriate way, we can capture data in a fashion where we won't lose it, especially when we're road testing a vehicle and especially when we're capturing intermittent 
very quickly occurring faults. Um, I do want to be the first one to point out that the lab scope I chose to use in this case, a Pico lab scope, has a tremendous amount of storage in its buffer, in its data storage tank, if you will. So the need to implement a trigger would not have been necessary with this scope. I could simply let the scope continue to capture data over a very long period of time and there'd be enough storage space uh, in, my, in my PC to store all the information for me to go sifting back through that and, and to pinpoint where my fault was located in that data buffer. However, not every scope operates like that, especially your handheld devices. Um, it just simply doesn't have enough storage space in its buffer to hold all that information, uh, especially on an extended road test. So being able to set a trigger um, helps tremendously, especially when you are away from the vehicle for any extended period of time. Uh, for instance, I had something very similar occur to me years ago with a vehicle and a stall would in fact occur and the point is I was nowhere near the vehicle when the stall occurs simply because after a 20 minute road test uh, I did not experience the symptom and I in fact had to let the vehicle idle in my bay with the hood closed to generate enough heat to cause the the symptom to surface um, at that point in time I was working on another vehicle nowhere near this one and someone else in the shop alerted me to the fact that the vehicle had indeed stalled and when I walked back to the vehicle, sure enough, that data was still paused on the screen for me simply because the trigger criteria wouldn't update with the engine stopped. So trigger functionality saved the day with that vehicle. Again, I want to thank you all for joining me again for part two in our series of Mastering Diagnostics with me, Brandon Steckler. I look forward to the next video, and I hope you join me then. Take care.